Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Nano Safety Cluster Training Day today. This is Martin Himley. I'm from the University of Salzburg. I'm the chair of the working group A on education, training and communication of the nano safety cluster. A warm welcome by the coordination team and by the steering group of the nano safety cluster. We are very proud and we are happy to, we um, even after the nano safety digital conference, which I guess was a great event past week and uh, also after the education day of the nano safety cluster past Monday, which was also um, attended quite well. Um, have another more in-depth training day today, and we are going to have two different uh, parallel sessions. And this is parallel session one in room A. We have another parallel session in room B. Um, you have a, on this slide, you can see the agenda for today. We try to make it really interactive. Um, it's working group overarching. So we have presentations from different working groups here also. Um, it looks very much into in silico tools, of course, uh, into what, what can you do with your data. Um, we had already a big uh, promotion of data fairness past week. <clears throat> a few housekeeping announcements from my side. Um, we would like to make this very interactive really useful for you that you can also tra train yourself um, in hands-on. So we are going to have uh, later on also some sessions where we invite you to participate um, even in parallel by um, loading up the tool, getting your data into um, and trying it out. For this uh, purpose we have installed and you can see this on the top, there is a green panel with, with, a, with, a, with a red button we have installed a dashboard. This was powered by our Nano Commons project. Um, and there you find all the links, again, to the tools that are there. Of course, you would find many of them if you just Google. But here, here they are, all of them are um, collected. You find useful further links to uh, training material. Um, you fi find further information um, there. So please go to this, uh, to this dashboard. Um, and check it out. Um, what you would also find there are links for um, breakout rooms provided by Zoom. Um, so it's Zoom links that we have installed also by the Nano Commons team um, to some of the sessions, uh, primarily for the next session starting at 10 o'clock and uh, the one in the afternoon, where you can then get uh, experts supporting you um, if you have a problem, uh, for example, installing something, running something, do uh, need a kind of parameter value or something to get a better uh, outcome of what you tried in parallel to work on. We are going to do this lots by screen sharing of some experts um, that run you through the tools. Um, the very first presentation by Lang Tan is going to give some insight in the mo models, however, in how they're operated and gives an introduction to, the, to, the, to these, um, uh, these approaches. Um, I will also put into the chat, and please you make use of the chat box uh, whenever you have the feeling you want to ask something. Uh, I will put into the chat also the mailing list of Working Group A. So if you need, uh, if, you are, if you would like to get more information, get more training and education on anything that regards the, nano, the entire nano safety cluster, please approach us, join the mailing list, um, and stay tuned with our. Uh, I would say quite active uh, working group. One more thing I would like to announce at 10 o'clock, the interactive training on nano extract image analysis tool is gonna start. So for this, uh, there is the offer by the Andreas Fantitis from Nervo Mechanics that you, we can definitely work on your TM images that you have used and that you are interested in producing getting uh, nano descriptors um, calculated from. So you can go also to via the dashboard to a uh, Google document where you can upload a TM image, which you would like to have presented as one of the examples there. And maybe you have a couple of uh, questions regarding uh, this uh, nano descriptor generation tool. 
so much, I guess, for the beginning. I just have a quick look whether I forgot something. So please use the chat box um, whenever you have questions. We put on display that your, your, your questions either after the session, if the presenters prefer like that, or even uh, during the sessions that we can answer your questions right away um, at the stage when they are arising. With this, I wish you um, good luck and have fun and hopefully have a very educational and informative day with us. Um, stay tuned with us, go to the dashboard, um, stay tuned with the working group A, go to the mailing list, subscribe there and approach us if you have any kind of question or concern. And so I would like to now uh, announce the first um, presenter who is Lang Tran. Many of you will probably know him, maybe not in person yet, but in his name probably from the Patrols project. And he's going to give us some first presentation on in silico tools for nano safety research um, from his perspective. <clears throat> Hello, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry for the slight delay. It always happens when you first time use something. Um, I would like to talk to everybody today about the in silico tools that uh, has been developed in nano safety research. Uh, this tool has been developed uh, before the patrol project and uh, it has been developed further with the patrols project for those who remember me i ran the course action modena in which we try to bring people together to develop the or to promote the in silico tools and uh, as a result of that, uh, the Commission has uh, awarded two projects on uh, in silico tools for nano safety research. Uh, they are the nano Soviet and nano informatics, and you hear from them uh, later today. But uh, my job today is to show you what we are doing in the Patrol project in relation to in silico tools. So, what I'm going to talk to you about is uh, three types of models. They have been developed by three different groups uh, at uh, in, a, in in the patrol project. The first type of model is called the PPK model, and this is developed by RIVM. Uh, it is PP. PK stands for physiologically based pharmacokinetic models. And then we have the QSAR model, which is the quantitative structure activity relationship model. Uh, this is developed by our Polish friend at QSAR lab. And finally, we have the in vitro dosimetry model. And this, this model has been developed by the uh, American first, but uh, we have taken over their work and put together as a software uh, so that we can calculate uh, the dose in various in vitro situations to give you the real doses that uh, reaches the cell instead of just the administrative dose. The QSAR model, as you know, is uh, about linking the particles and Physical, physical characteristic and link it to the responses. So that is why uh, it is about structure and activity. It's about linking the chemical, physical characteristic of a particle to the observed responses. Uh, and the PBBK is about taking the exposure and from the exposure, you calculate the buildup of the dose in the different organs in vivo. Okay, so I I hope you follow what I'm talking about. So there are three type of model here. First, you have to take from exposure to the dose in an in vivo situation. The second thing is, once you have the dose, you then ask the question, what kind of Particle physical characteristics are most important in 
driving the response that you observe. And the third one is a practical type of model, is that we want to work out the amount of particles that get to the cell in an in vitro model, because between the, the, the particle and the cells, there's a layer of liquid and depend on, depending on the characteristic of the particle, they do not go straight into the cell. They will take time to accumulate down at the bottom. So you, you need to, 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 to be aware of that because you can imagine a very light particle which just float on the top of the, the liquid and never reach the cell. So of course, if it doesn't reach the cell, it doesn't cause any response. That doesn't mean that uh, it's not toxic. It's just that it never get a chance to get to the bottom. Okay, so that gives you a very uh, brief introduction of what type of model that we use. So what I'm going to do today is to give you an introduction about this type of model. Uh, they are rather complicated type of model and each of them would deserve a session on its own. And I hope in uh, the patrol project, we will be able to arrange a more kind of interactive type of uh, workshop so that we can demonstrate on how to use them. But at the moment, what I hope is to give you a favor of what they do and how you can use it to interpret the data that you are generating in your lab. Okay. So now let's start with the PPPK model. Okay. And one of the, the, the ultimate use of this PPPK model is to relate what you do in vitro, the, the result of the dose response uh, experiment that you do in vitro to what people observe in vivo. And by in vivo, we mean animal experiment. Okay. Now, this is a very interesting topic because if we can relate the in vitro to in vivo, then of course, you don't have to do too many animal experiments. And uh, this is very ethical and it is supportive by the commission. So what we try to do is to extrapolate or find a correlation between the uh, in vitro result and the in vivo, okay? And we will do that by looking at the in vitro experiment on the lung or the liver or the gut model, there are several such models for these different organs. And we try to extrapolate the dose that you use uh, in uh, vitro to in vivo, taking into account that, of course, the in vitro exposure, the, the exposure time is very short. And in, 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 in vivo, the, the dose is uh, very long term. So you, you not only had to extrapolate in vitro to in vivo, but you also had to take into account the difference in, in the duration between short term exposure, long term exposure, and so on. And so th for this reason, because we need to understand the dynamic of the building up the dose in an in vivo situation, we need to develop a quantitative model to describe it. And of course, the data we use are mainly the RAT model because we have uh, plenty of data uh, from animal experiment based on the RAT. And of course, in these uh, experiments, they, they, they are mainly testing TiO2 or serum. And this is what I'm going to show you next. The data is available in the IO2 and, and serum. So the data they, they, they use for this animal experiment, uh, as you see there with NM105 and NM212. Now, again, let's go back to this conceptual idea about in vitro and vivo and how we correlate each of them. Uh, so you start to the left, you have in vitro, 
And most of you have done this kind of those response in vitro. Okay. And for there, the dose is described as the administered dose. Later on, I'll show that we can do better than just the administered dose or the administered concentration by looking at the amount that actually get into the cell using the in vitro dosimetry. Okay. And this is what we mean by that. The, the, what we've done in uh, patrol is to collate all these different models and put them together as a kind of software and you can use to, to work from the from the administered dose down to the delivered dose at the cell system, okay? Then if we assume equivalent dose, meaning we had to scale it so that uh, it become comparable to what you see in vivo, such as you describe the dose in as microgram per centimeter square of uh, the tissue area, okay, the, the area where the dose is, is getting it to. Then we can take that dose over, and this is the kind of dose, and we can then fit into the PPK model, okay, and work backward to find out what is the administered dose or concentration in vivo that gives you the equivalent, uh, the, the equivalent uh, scale dose between in vitro and in vivo. So you can see from the left, we then go to the right, we use the PPPK, then we come back to the equivalent concentration in the air, for example, in vivo. And this has been uh, attempted many times in, uh, in nanotoxicology, and I'm glad to report to everybody that we, we do see a very nice correlation, uh, at least for insoluble nanomaterials, between in vitro and vivo for the lung. Okay, then this is a great uh, achievement because most of the data that we have are lung data. So, uh, so this is this is where we are at the moment. Uh, how to extrapolate in vitro and in vivo for liver or for the gut is, is, is still a work in progress. So this model, it describes the, the distribution of the material in the body over time, as I explained to you. It showed you the buildup in the lung, in the liver, uh, and this is the happening following an inhalation exposure. So we're looking at how an animal is exposed through inhalation uh, and the particle get into the lung and from the lung it then distributed uh, to all the other organs, okay? And then it, it can, you, we, once you have these models, then you can, as I explained to you earlier on, we can do an inverse uh, dosimetry, meaning for the dose, we can calculate backward to find out what is the external exposure that gives you that dose in vivo. Or we can do forward dosimetry, meaning we can work out what kind of exposure we would give in vivo that gives you the equivalent dose range in vitro. So that is a forward way. So if you look at the in vitro dose range that you apply and you ask yourself, what kind of exposure would give you an equivalent dose in the lung, for example, to what you see in vitro? And then once you have that model, then you can actually play with the different exposure scenario. You can do a chronic, uh, you can do an intermittent exposure, you know, five days a week, and you can, you can vary a lot of uh, exposure scenario uh, and see how that would be translated into the dose. And the nice thing, if we have an in vitro and in, in vivo, and you know the correlation, it would help to interpret the in vitro data in the most in a more meaningful way and and and, and you would be able to say this this is what i give uh, the cell line in vitro and this would be an equivalent to what you would ex what you would see when your rat is exposed to such and such concentration for how many hours a day for how long 
And this is something that uh, that I think this is, is very useful for uh, in vitro experimentalists to know about uh, what they are doing and they can relate it to in vivo. What I'm not talking today to everybody is the last step, is that once you have the animal in vivo, how do you extrapolate to human? And that is more challenging because of course, the correlation between uh, animal and humans can only be done if we have data in human. And here, of course, as you all know, there's no data in humans. So there we have to apply uncertainties, factors and so on. In other words, we'll make a good guess on how, to, how we're going to shoot from animal to humans. But uh, well, this is not the topic that we're talking about today. We're talking about in vitro and in vivo. So here we have data and we're much more certain about the extrapolation. So as you say, this is the kind of model that uh, I work with uh, our IVM and we have developed it. And basically the most important part is to start from air concentration. Uh, this is an inhalation exposure scenario, okay? Then it goes into the lung and the lung is described as this box up here, okay? And most importantly is in the alveolar region that we're looking uh, into. And from the alveolar, it pass on to the interstitium and then into the blood. Some of it will go into the lymph node and some go into the blood. But once it gets into the blood, it's now right in the highway for circulation to other organ. And there you can see how it can go to the GI tract, to the spleen, the liver, the heart, the brain, the rest of the body, the kidney, and so on. Okay, so this, this, this is one type of uh, exposure scenario that we look at. And of course, you can also look at an oral dosing in which it goes straight into the gastrointestinal tract and then it gets circulated to the blood and so on. So the motor has been built in here and how do you describe that model mathematically? Now that's, that is uh, a, a challenge uh, at least it's a challenge for me to try to explain this equation to all of you. Uh, but I, I, I don't think it is that uh, difficult to, 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 to get the concept of it because this is a compartment, okay? And there is what goes in and what goes out of compartment. Okay, so for example, this is the tissue. The bigger compartment is the, the tissue, for example. And inside it, there's a subcompartment uh, representing the, the alveolar macrophage, for example. And of course, there are particles that goes into macrophage and there are particles that goes out. It's just like there are particles that go from the tissue to the blood and there are particles that go from the blood to the tissue, okay? So this is the equation. And it is on your left here, it, this, is called the rate, okay? So this is how the concentration of particle in the blood change over time, okay? It equal to what goes from the blood, from the blood into the tissue, yeah? And it is added with what goes from the tissue to the blood. So whatever goes into the, the blood is positive and what goes out of the blood, obviously, is negative, yeah? Do you see what I'm saying? I hope you can. So basically, it is in and out. Every or every compartment has an in rate and an out rate. And the the balance between the in and out is what drives the, 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 the change in the concentration in the compartments, if, if you follow what I'm saying. So in all these, uh, equation, you say the rate of change is always equal to what goes in minus what goes out, okay? And of course, to describe the rate of what goes in and the rate of what goes out, you have different parameters. Now, in an ideal world, 
you would know all these parameters and you just flood the number in and you are able to, to run them. However, uh, in reality, of course, we don't know all these parameters because they are, they are particle dependent. So what goes in from the tissue to the blood is very much a function of the particle, physical, chemical characteristics. So it, it, it will be very particle dependent. And if you have uh, the data from experiment with a lot of particles, then you are able to actually compare this rate between one particle and another and, and eventually get an understanding about how this rate constant vary from particle to particles, okay? And to do that, again, you know, so for example here, you also have to look at the, the, the rate constant for the solution, for example. And uh, this we might be able to derive from in vitro experiment. So there are many aspects uh, of, of, of this model that uh, require input from outside the model. Like we can fit in the dissolution from uh, experiment on this solution that can be done in vitro, for example. Okay, so as I say, the, the, the model is not fully characterized until you know all the parameters, okay? And to do that, we had to, to generate the outcome of the model and compare that to the data. The data, as I say, are the CEO2 and TIO2 here, okay? And uh, we would then estimate the parameters so that the, the model prediction and the data fit the best, yeah. And the method for doing it, uh, for the parameter distribution, is uh, the Bayesian parameter estimation. And Bayesian means that you usually start with the prior knowledge of these uh, parameters and you are going to improve them as you fit uh, the model to the data. As I say, the Bayesian parameter estimation is you start with an initial parameter estimate okay from greater cross from previous experiment or making a best guess for example okay so you you, you have some initial idea what the, this parameter is supposed to be then you modify the initial one by the likelihood function then uh, this this likelihood is is a measure of how well the model with the parameterization describes the data and then you come out uh, with a better estimate of the parameter, okay? So this is the prior estimation and this is the posterior. So the prior is multiplied by uh, the likelihood will give you a posterior estimation. And this is an iterative process that eventually it cannot get any better and that's the final parameter set that you have. And so we use data, as I've said, you have data from two year inhalation uh, experiment uh, with flat for different concentration group, you know. Uh, and this, this data are definitely used for estimating the model and to, to, to try to estimate the, the parameters of the model is to calibrate the model as the model prediction with the data. That is why in the literature, sometimes you hear the word calibration. Calibration is when you try to make sure that the model fit the data the best, okay? So we have here a list of parameters that uh, we cannot uh, find it from anywhere else. It needs to be estimated. So here you are, and uh, the result when we run comparing, keep comparing the model prediction with the, the, the data on Serum, uh, and we get 
we we get some number out of it with a nice range and the confidence interval that we get out of it. <clears throat> and you can see here uh, the, the, the prediction that we, we have in here. Uh, so this is the prediction of the simulated uh, organ burden comparing to, to the data, okay? And again, we do that also for TiO2, but with the TiO2, we have uh, we have quite a bit of data. So we have uh, what's in the lung, what is in the lung institution, what is in the liver, what is in the facy, and what is in the urine. You can see that with this, uh, group of parameter and their value estimated. This is what uh, uh, the method has uh, given us. So, so this is uh, the next thing that we're doing because this is still the work in progress. We're still waiting for more in vivo data that uh, uh, are due to us right now from. Uh, on the RIVM as they're doing some in vivo experiments. And uh, we will use this as a prior, as I explained to you, as a, as a prior estimate of the, the, the parameters and we're going to apply it to this new data set to see how uh, it looks like. And once we have that, we will have a, a, a nice dose response in vivo that would then allow us to compare with the in vitro data by uh, our author partner, and then you hear from them later on. Now, what I'm going to talk to you now is about the QSA model. That's uh, another type of model that is trying to explain the, uh, the, the, the particle characteristic, the descriptor, as, as they call it in, 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 in this type of modeling and try to link that to the response. Okay, and uh, here is uh, an illustration of what our Polish uh, QSA lab people has uh, been doing with uh, multiple carbon nanotube. Okay, and this is the uh, adverse uh, pathway that uh, they are looking for fibrosis. Okay. So, they, they're looking into this and they developed uh, a kind of descriptor so that they can explain the, 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 the pathway from inflammation to the loss of alveolar capillary integrity to fibroblast uh, proliferation and the deposition of collagen in the extracellular matrix. And that's what they end up with is fibrosis. And here the model was much more simple. They look at the benchmark dose and they work out a regression. And this is a very nicely fit regression uh, of the benchmark dose as a function of this descriptor kappa. And kappa, interestingly enough, is defined as the aspect ratio, okay? And the benchmark goes here is the value for the agranulocyte adhesion and the apodesis. So that, that is basically the response. And they, 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 they got a, a very good uh, correlation because the, the R square, the, the, fit, the goodness of fit is pretty good. And they also use this model to actually looking into transcriptomic kind of uh, grouping strategy. And they find again that, it, you know, you can actually distinguish two groups of multi-wall carbon nanotube. Those that has very high value, high aspect ratio, and they're all grouped together in, 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 in one uh, in, in one corner, and then you have the tango, meaning the one that actually twists and turn, and basically with a lower uh, 
aspect ratio and they, they are totally separate between the one and the other. And this, this is something that is very useful for classification and grouping and, and so on. So you need to have to, to use the, the, the model, you need to have the BFD value, of course, you need to have the nano QSAT actually link the particle descriptor, okay, with the BM value, and you can also do that with the gene expression. Now, they have actually developed further into something useful in here. Uh, they have given me the link to, to their work but uh, they sent it to me only yesterday and it, it, it was too late to, to be included in this talk. But uh, for those who are interested to use this, please contact me and I will direct you in, in the right way. So you can actually play around with this thing. Uh, it, it's the first time that uh, you know we, we use a, a, a tool to actually quantify this AOP that as you see. So again, you know, to, to use a model, you need to tell the length of your carbon nanotube, the diameter of carbon nanotube, it then work out the aspect ratio and it can read out, uh, you know, in terms of nano QSA model. And it can then group you to say which group of uh, uh, your nanotube belongs to. And you see, this, 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 this model is actually quite good because if you see here, uh, this is a model in uh, prediction, which is in purple here. And later on, they compare that with another data set independent. And this is not about doing regression or anything. And you see the, the, the predict, the validation of the model, the data set that validate the model, the orange bit fit quite nicely with the the purple one. So the model has a predictive power, so to say. And again, if you use this software, it will allow you to, to guess what kind of gene revolution your carbon nanotube will be, what gene is up and what gene is down, depending on the information you fit into it. And I, I would uh, as, as I say, those of you who are interested in, in playing with, with what this is, I will give you the link to, to, to their, their little model. So, you read in the data and it can make nicely prediction here for the various uh, carbon nanotubes that we have in, in the project. And then the data here are also contributed to, to us by uh, Health Canada. Now, I'm going to the last model, and that might be of interest to all of you who had to do in vitro experiments. And in parallel to all your in vitro experiments, you, you all know that uh, there has been several models that try to describe the, the dynamics of the dose as it sink in. Uh, into the bottom of your uh, in vitro well. And what our colleague here at the uh, University of Pisa has done is that they took the math and they programmed it into a very nice piece of software. So you don't have to worry about the maths, uh, but they, they, they then make it in a user-friendly interface that you can use. And at, uh, and at the moment in our science, there are three such models, the DG model, the ISDD model, and the ISD3 model. Uh, here that gives you a different uh, description of uh, each of these type of model, and it, you, you can choose which one you think is the most appropriate to the condition that you have. So we, we have created a user interface, that's what, that's what GUI is, uh, so it's a nice graphical user interface that would uh, try to help you to estimate the dose at which the cell at the bottom of the, the well. 
So it integrates the three well established in silico model that we, we that are available just now. And it converts the input parameter which model, HSC's model, originally the, the, the input, the parameter that you need to supply into the model for it to run, they're kind of uh, slightly different from one model to another. So there's a lot of work in trying to harmonize these, uh, these input parameters into a common form so that they can be used across all these three model. And once you set that, then you will, the, it will allow the evaluation of each of model robustness for, uh, as I say, to the specific application by fitting that to the experimental data that the exper experimentalists generate. So it's nothing better than a graph and you can see uh, in, to the left here, you can have all your parameter that you can easily input in here and to the right, you can see the, a, a graph, uh, the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the concentration uh, on the cells. So you can see that will be building up all the time, okay? So it would be really nice, uh, perhaps in another workshop that we set up, we take you uh, by the hand and show you how to use it, but it's quite straightforward. You can input different number uh, representing the nature of the world, the nature of the liquid that you have, the particle characteristics and so on. And then the concentration, of course, then you will try to predict uh, the building up of that those uh, on top of the cell in time. For example, here, this will simulate the amount that is in the liquid over the cell. And of course, as the particles that is landed first, first on, on the liquid would then sink into the cell. So you see this amount diminish in time, okay? This is about the, the time course of the amount, the concentration of particles in the liquid above the cell. And of course, you, you don't do that without actually comparing uh, what you get uh, with uh, the data. And of course, in patrol, we have in vitro data for cerium, for TiO2, for BSO4, and uh, at different concentration. And you can see how, how this, uh, this model performed. It, it performed quite well with the experimental data. For two different types of in vitro, the, the one which is gelatin coated bottom and the one without coating. So, you know, you can imagine here the gelatin coated bottom, it, 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 it gives a sticky boundary condition. And of course, if there's no coating, then there's no, that we apply a no flux boundary condition to, to say. So if you have an experimental setting like this one, then you identify the most suitable model for that represent the sedimentation dynamic, and you can test that with insoluble nanomaterial that uh, you have in mind. And again, you can see here our prediction uh, have very good uh, goodness of fit for the three materials uh, on an in vitro situation like uh, described to the left. And again, you can see, as I, I explained to you before, uh, you can see the building up at the bottom, the cumulative dose for different material at the bottom in here. This is the kind of thing that you are interested. Perhaps this is what you should use this to relate it, to relate with your responses instead of counting on the administrative dose. Yeah. So now, this is now 
where we are working on because uh, apart from using this kind of uh, flat bottom kind of uh, in vitro experiment we are also using a spheroid as a, a model for for an organ okay and this is quite challenging because if you drop particle on a spheroid you have to try to estimate what is the dose a on the surface of the steroid and b how does that in time sink inside you know into the, the spheroid and this is something that uh, our friends at pisa has been working on and you can see here they try to estimate it so if you drop something right on the the, the top of the spheroid like this then obviously this is the highest concentration and then as you move out toward the edge of the spheroid there are less and less particles for example but this is through our discussion we know that this is actually not very close to reality because in an in vitro setting the spheroid tend to roll about inside in vitro and it doesn't stay still for you to drop things so this is just a first step at, at trying to estimate what happened when the particle managed to land onto a static spheroid. We had to think about randomly moving construct because the spheroid roll about in, in, in inside in vitro system, and obviously that would that would result in a kind of dosimetry that are much more complicated and. This is where we are, this is how we are working on it. So, I think uh, that gives you a very brief overview about the type of models that we have, how useful they are for the different parts of uh, nano safety uh, approach that uh, you guys are studying. And hopefully in nano Soviet and in nano informatics, they would then take this type of model, put them together into a platform that would then be made available for all of you to use to actually compare in vitro with in vivo, getting the right dose out from in vitro experiments and figure out what are the particle characteristics which drive the response that you observe. So, you see, this is what we do on the modeling side of uh, nano safety. And one of the things that I did mention is that, of course, the ultimate objective in all of that is to try to control the exposure so that it doesn't yield a adverse responses. And all of that can be done on the computer now, uh, as, the, as more and more data are generated, and we begin to feel very confident about the predictive power of these uh, models. It, 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 it would be a very useful tool for experimentalists to have it uh, by their side so that they can, uh, they can help, they can use it to help them to interpret that data but also to inform the experimental design as well. And I think these are the, the, the great contribution of uh, the models that, uh, that, that we have. So with, with that, uh, I will stop and we have uh, eight minutes uh, to discuss any question from all of you. So please ask me a question. Thank you very much, Lang. This was a very nice and great um, introduction, actually, into several very interesting um, areas of nano safety research, <coughs> use of data, how to um, progress. We have um, indeed got two questions so far, and I would put them on display now. Ah, uh, the which of the three dosimetry model might be appropriate for high aspect ratio nanomaterial well emilio it, it depends what you you want to to do 
suppose that uh, you have high aspect ratio nanomaterials and you want to know the lows that get into the lung uh, in an in vivo situation, yes, then obviously the PTPK is your kind of model because it calculates the buildup of the dose in an animal, okay? Now, if you want to know what drives the response, what are the particle descriptors that drive the response, okay? Uh, and especially you look at it through doing in vitro study, then the CubeSA is your best bet because CubeSA just tell you exactly just that. It tell you about how the response, the responses are related to the particle characteristic. In this case, the high aspect ratio that you just mentioned. And of course, uh, one of the details that you have to take into account when you look at the in vitro data is to make sure that you, you're looking at the right doses, not just the administered dose. And, uh, if you do in vitro experiment, you know that the, the, the multiple carbon nanotube has this problem that it tends to float around on the surface when you, you you introduce it into an in vitro system and it 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 this it, it landed on the bottom in in a gradual manner so you know that that timing for the build up of the dose is, is also something that you have to take into account when you set up your experiment so yep to answer your your question the most to me the most important model is the dose symmetry is the pppk model because it tells you about in vivo the dose in vivo okay the the high aspect ratio and the grouping to to, to see which group it belongs to is also useful uh, for grouping uh, purposes and of course the in vitro dosimetry will help you to interpret your in vitro uh, data better. So that that are my three criteria. They, 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 there's no such a thing as one is better than other. They are all very useful for different purposes. That's the point. We also had something from PBPK, um, a question rather early in your talk. Yes. put it on display yeah i the model at the moment uh, are only based on rat data but hey there's nothing to stop you if you have the the data for zebrafish it is very easy to build an equivalent type of model for zebrafish uh i haven't seen such data and i will be more than happy if you talk to me further what kind of data you have on zebrafish and I can help you to build one and that will be a fantastic way of doing the reason that we always stick with the rat is because that's regulatory toxicology to you that's that's how historically the data always generated but uh, yet this model can be modified to deal with any type of animal uh, I would be very interested in it. And if you talk to me, Anna, uh, we'll be able to work on something on the side. If you have that kind of data, we'll be able to build a model. Thank you. Any, yeah. any other question? So far, I did not see one, but I ask once again to the audience, um, please put your Hi. questions into the Hi. chat Hi. box. Okay, there is an answer. Yes, Anna, thank you. We, I look forward to, you, you have my email address. It's not difficult to find me. So send me an email and we will take it from there. Well, I would also like to thank you, Tran, Lang Tran, for uh, presenting today and giving this nice introduction and overview of different models.